<coughs> I brought my friends with me. See, this is for all those people that think I'm not a softy inside, that somehow I'm some kind of mean character. Most people know better. <laughs> so I had to bring my friend out with me. Now, some of you are thinking, well, get a dog, get a cat. Taco meat? I don't think so. Burritos? No. I'm sick. <laughs> no, I've had dogs, but my point being is that the way people are obsessed with animals lately, I don't want to be possessed with an animal. <laughs> you know, it's hard enough dealing with just Christians, much less having some animal to deal with too. But since my wife is getting sick, I figured I needed this guy to keep an eye on me because uh Otherwise, you know, I might let my attitude get to me, you know, so I figured I'd just stick him right under the camera, so with his little smiley face, you know, and his little demeanor. Maybe it would be a... Happy Valentine's Day! Oh, forgot to tell you, he kisses me too. <laughs> but <coughs> making a comeback, especially with being ill, is a challenge because, you know, a lot of times people think that Oh, Christians don't get sick. Yeah, they do. We just don't let it rule our lives. Or as much as we let anything rule our lives, because we're all kind of ornery and all kind of you know carnal in some ways. That sometimes, you know, some of us, especially when we're sick, are more carnal than others. Honey, can you bring me? <laughs> Because in some ways, when you're sick, you revert to your baby attitude. You know, like, I don't feel good. <laughs> so you're trying to get what you can, you know, because, you know, nobody else can put up with it. So you kind of dump it all on your wife, your girlfriend, your friend, your neighbor, your relatives, whoever it is that will listen to you because misery loves company. But often people forget to turn to the Lord. You know, they don't seek out first Jesus, who likewise suffered and bore our infirmities even as we suffer and bear infirmities at times but we only do so in part because you see we have a new nature inside we have a difference that makes a difference with our lives the difference is what's inside comes outside when we reflect the image of who he is from outside to inside if I didn't say that right <laughs> And you're looking at me like, well, I'm delirious. <laughs> and I have an excuse. What's your excuse? <laughs> but <coughs> Tozer, you know, I took my glasses off. See how delirious I am? Tozer makes great points today, so I was like really amazed. I thought, oh, that is so cool. Because <coughs> it goes along with my my feelings about how Christians should be real, you know, is that when I was growing up, we were told to be transparent, you know, that was the big buzzword, was to let the walls down, and, you know, as Jesus freaks, it was pretty easy to do, because, you know, being a bunch of hippies, you know, running around with long hair and all this stuff, you know, we kind of, you know, wanted to get rid of our, our societal trash, you know, and be real. Well, as it turns out, Christians put on societal trash, and now they're not real. You see, sometimes Christians have a Christian veneer. They shellacked the outside, but forgot to deal with the inside. So sometimes the inside is more than what the outside is, or sometimes the outside looks good, but <laughs> watch out for the inside. Hmm, <laughs> that veneer just isn't that thick. So God wants to make you an oak tree, not a veneer of oak. He doesn't want you to just, you know, kind of like take that rotted wood and slap something on top of it and make it look good. He wants you to be a planting of the Lord, not a shaving of God. <laughs> he doesn't want you to cut off the bark, you know, and then kind of like, you know, plane out the wood, you know, and make this like, you know, oh, look at this nice wood. I could carve it into something. No, he wants you to be his living sacrifice, not a dead example of what a Christian should be. And that's why we seek the Lord daily. We want to walk with him always. We want to continually seek his face always being listening for that moment he might say hey 
turn left. Oh, now? You know, you don't wait. You do it. Oh, wow, look at that. There's a, a oncoming, you know, speeding, whatever that is, speeding, you know, because I can't see it because I'm delirious. Delirious is the idea of being delirious and being blind at the same time. So if you're delirious, you really are sick. Happens when you get too much mucus in the <laughs> Confucius area. <laughs> Confucius say, mucus, no good. <laughs> but the reality of our life's existence should be that determination to seek to follow God's will, to listen to when God would speak, to hear His voice when He would direct us. Because you don't know when God may intervene in your life. So we commit our way unto the Lord in the morning. We determine to open our eyes to the opportunities to see God in whatever it is that may be going on. We kind of evaluate everything as not just a learning experience, but a development process whereby we are doing the work of the ministry, or doing a ministry, or doing the reality of living like Jesus said to live, being his example of what a believer is. So, when you live your life, you should always be open and <coughs> open and, I want to say opportune, but it just doesn't seem to fit the circumstance. It's like my brain goes, we're going to make a connection. No, we're not. <laughs> Part of my right brain goes, connect here, and you know, the little charge goes across. You know, we've talked about this before, you know, with brain synopsis. Well, my little charge goes, nope, uh-uh, <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> You're not going to think straight. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, then spirit will take over. So, the opportunity to take our lives and present them as a living sacrifice to God daily, which is a reasonable service and acceptable in His sight, is one of just simply being open to the leading of His Spirit as He chooses to direct us. Because he knows what we're going to do. He knows what we're going to say. He knows how we're going to react. But our learning of how to operate in that way, to walk in the Spirit, so to speak, to operate in those things that he wants us to do, is simply that matter of us walking and participating with him in his life, not our own. Because, you see, when you take it for yourself, then you're kind of doing your own thing. You know, When you're doing your own thing, you're kind of like, yeah, I got it. It's me. I did it my way, huh? You way, no way. Highway, bet you. One way, Jesus, huh? There's no way to go up, though. So you see, it's impossible for you to do the things that God wants you to do of your own ability. You can't. It's impossible for you to know when he wants you to do something of your own thinking. You can't. Jesus said it pretty blunt. He said, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my thoughts from your thoughts, and so removed are my ways from your ways. So, no offense, but your idea of the highway or my way is not even any way that I'm telling you to go. Because today I'm saying, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So he wants to tenderize us first, to get us sensitized. So sometimes sickness even sensitizes us. Boy, does it. Sometimes it gets us so tender that we're like, every little thing we snap at. Happy Valentine's Day! See, I have to cheer myself up, you know, after snapping at somebody, you know, so I have to go, okay, yeah. <laughs> but when we look at Tozer teaching us and we look at the Spirit of God applying to us, the reality of what He wants to speak to us, then we begin to open our eyes to the possibility of living life in a different way. A life that's directed, not a life that's just reactive. In other words, a lot of the things that people do in life are just activities. They do things because they should do them. They're supposed to do them. They're expected to do them but they're not directed to do them. The Christian life is meant to be directed. The footsteps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. The direction of a man's heart, of course, is his own. But God says he will direct his footsteps. Now, I don't know about you, 
maybe you could get away with sitting still and doing a whole lot of things, especially if you're sitting on the internet and you could be playing around doing all kinds of weird things. But when it comes to the footsteps of a righteous man ordered of the Lord, that means he's setting them in place. He's telling you one step at a time what to do. If you don't get your marching orders, don't do it. Are you kidding? I get fired. Well, you might. You might get hired. <laughs> you might get fired, you might get hired. Hmm. You might get higher, or you might get lower. The point being is that the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. When we trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning out in our own understanding and all our ways acknowledging Him, and letting Him direct our path, He kind of gives you that direction every day. He will say to you bluntly, you know, Thou sluggard, why are thou sleeping late? You know, and a little folding of the hands, you know, a little nodding of the head, you know, a little sleep later, you know. No, you know, he's going to tell you, like, get up out of bed, get going. Sometimes. Or sometimes he'll say, look, yesterday I told you to get out of bed. If you don't already know that, I ain't going to talk to you. The reality is, is that we go from step to step. Each step ordered of the Lord. And as we do, we develop what's called a relationship. We learn to go, hmm... It's kind of like in the Marine Corps when they're putting you out on the pavement, you know, and if you know what the pavement is, then you know what that deck is, you know, that you're going to be marching on because left, right, left, right, left, right. You always hear the marching orders. The drill instructor or the one in charge that's giving you the orders is telling you to move your left foot and your right foot. Left, right, left, right. You had to get home when you left, you're right. Jody was there when you left. You sing these things and you march these things because you're meant to do them in order. Now, in Jewish thought, it's called a Seder, but, you know, we just say order, so we'll get it back to a Gentile way of thinking because Gentiles love military. You know, why? I don't know. God help us, you know, because I'd rather be a missionary than, you know, military. You know, it's like, which choice do you want? A gun or a cross? I'll take the cross. <laughs> No offense, but you go shoot somebody, but I'm going to go save somebody. I'd rather put them in heaven than put them in hell. <laughs> I don't know. It's your choice. But <coughs> for me, in the military when I was in it, you know, you'd be told left, right, left, right, left, right, you know, and you'd be going along, you know, straight, you know, and then you'd go, left face, you know, and you'd go left face, you know, because I was like, you turned, you know, and you immediately pivoted on that foot. Well, that's kind of what the Lord says. He says he'll tell you, you know, he'll whisper in your ear. You better hope it's a whisper, because if he yells in your ear like a drill instructor, you won't like it. <laughs> I think some people in some life circumstances wait until the circumstances make them move. You know, like a fire, a flood, you know, a tornado, or earthquake, you know, kind of like devastates them, you know. And then afterwards, a still small voice comes and says, I told you to move. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you did. You want me to go now, Lord? Yes. So, I don't know, you know, this Christian walk is easier if you develop it the way you're supposed to. Because development, like a child, I don't tell and I don't take some little baby and ship them off to the Marine Corps. You know, I wouldn't do that. That's stupid. First of all, the drill instructor would probably drop kick me into left field you know, and then take the baby, you know, and put him back in the crib where it belongs, you know. But, you train up a child as the way they should go. And even as you first get born again and saved, or you first start to turn your life back to God, or whatever it may be, you start in a process. You develop in a way. You grow in the church. You become trained up in a way, so that when it's time, you are sent off to specialized training. <laughs> <coughs> boot camp in some cases for some of you that need to have that structured, ordered life to be told left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, you had a good old hey. but even that is good because those that come out have a confidence they have a strength they have an inner faith now that faith may be called semper fi, you know, always faithful but from the Corps, in the Army they called other things, Air Force Marine, or Air Force, you know, and other services, but that inner faith nugget, so to speak, is what Christianity is all about. 
because without faith it's impossible to please God. And God wants to take you to a place of confidence in Him. But the only way you get that is through the boot camp of His development. And part of that development is learning to have a relationship with Him. As a baby learns a relationship with its mother, so too, you know, we need to learn to have a relationship with our God. Now, I don't know about you, but I like being hugged. I, you know, I kind of like singing songs in church, you know. And I like rejoicing, you know, and I like having fun. Happy Valentine's Day! You know, and I like, you know, when everything's going hunky-dory. But that's not what church is all about. Church is meant to develop you beyond that stage of just Sunday morning. Church was meant to coordinate your life so that you would come in the door on a Sunday and begin to choose those opportunities you can serve in, participate with, and become acquainted with others who will help you to grow as a Christian. you got to grow up. You're acting like a child. That eventually you have to mature and get along with other people. And that's what church is about. Learning to get along. Here is the church and here's the steeple. Open the door, see all the people. You know, you learn to get along by finding those in the church that you don't like and learning to like them because they're of the same mindset that you are, the same faith development. And then really as you go over their home and you learn their lives and their faith story and all the things that God's done with them, you begin to like them. You better. <laughs> if you don't, by this shall all men know you're my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another. Ah, you're not his disciple. So church is meant to disciple you, to grow you up, to make you become ready for the ministry. Now, you can go off in the ministry. It's easy, you know. You have a ministry from the moment you get saved. You can tell people about what you know. Not much, but whatever you know, you know. <laughs> and then you grow as you know. <laughs> and then people try to share what they don't know. And that's kind of where Tozer gets. He says, really, about talking in reality of being honest about who you are, where you are, and how you are. Be completely honest with God when you pray. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and sees the reins and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. Jeremiah 20.12 There's a vital element of true prayer which is likely to be overlooked in our artificial age. This vital element is just plain honesty, being honest, real, truthful. The saintly David McIntyre once wrote, Honest dealing becomes us when we kneel in our... Yeah. Can I go blow my nose first? <laughs> Ooh, headache. The saintly David McIntyre <coughs> once wrote, Honest kneeling... <laughs> honest dealing becomes us when we kneel in his pure presence. Then McIntyre continued, On one occasion, Jeremiah failed to interpret God the right way. He cried as if in anger, Oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. These are terrible words to utter before him who is changeless truth. But the prophet spoke as he felt, and the Lord not only pardoned him, but met him and blessed him right there. You know, I grew as a born-again Christian only in one way. I yelled at God regularly. The greatest growth I had wasn't coming from just sitting at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which I did. I was there seven days a week. You know, I happened to be dying and, you know, was on you know, limited incomes, but, you know, what the heck, you know, I mean, oh well, you know, God used it in his way to give me a chance to study, you know, and to enjoy the fellowship of the Word. But my greatest <coughs> growth always came when I got alone and yelled at God what I didn't understand. Now, maybe you're a smarty, <laughs> and you go to Bible college and this, that, and the other thing, and they give you all the answers, but me, I came up with questions that, you know, people don't answer, <laughs> really. And so I yelled at God about it. 
I wanted to know, you know, and I wanted to know personally what certain things were. And I would yell and scream and rant and rave and stomp around, you know, and be all mad about it, you know, and get out of my system. And then I'd always usually, maybe not every night, some nights I stayed mad for two or three days. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, I would be real. I was honest. And he was honest with me about it. He would take the time, and everything I ever yelled at God about, he answered. Really, he did. He eventually, maybe not at the moment, but eventually in time, always brought the answer and reminded me of the questions and the event. I remember all those times of yelling and screaming and being mad and you know being upset and then other times being you know, mumbling under my breath or you know accusatory of God. Now there is an accuser of the brethren and there is an accuser at God and that's Satan. But it's not wrong to have feelings about how we are dealing with God. Those things God appreciates because being hot about it is just as good as being cold about it because we're passionate about wanting the truth and we want to know God and if your heart is really in love with him in the first place it's okay to get mad about it and that's what Tozer wants us to recognize the reality of to be truthful about how you feel don't just put on praise because you think you're supposed to if you don't feel like praising don't <coughs> people at Calvary Chapel used to quit asking me how you doing because I'd say not that good <laughs> they would go, oh, it ain't no idea with me. One time I told Romaine that. <laughs> and he said, good. <laughs> I smiled and he smiled and I walked away. I was like, oh, I like this guy. <laughs> I think he got it. I don't know. I never asked him and he never asked me. But, you know, it was one of those things that I, I think he said, how are you? I already snarled at me, sinner, you know, one of the two. <laughs> he used to snarl at everybody and kind of go, sinner, you know, and you go, save my grace. <laughs> you're lucky you're saved. <laughs> or you're grateful you're saved, whichever. But the fun part was, you knew his heart was right. You know, and <coughs> you knew that he was not joking, but that there was a point to his me methodology. <coughs> I recall another spiritual writer of an unusual penetration has advised frankness in prayer even to a degree that might appear to be downright rudeness. When you come to prayer, he says, and find that you have no taste for it, tell God so without mincing words. Tell God you don't feel like it. If God and spiritual things bore you, admit it frankly. This advice will shock some squeamish saints, but it is altogether sound nevertheless. God loves the guileless soul even when, in his ignorance, he is actually guilty in, of rashness in prayer. The Lord can soon cure his ignorance, but for insincerity, no cure is known. We can learn something at this point, if we will. You know, people always have this generalization about prayer, that they don't take the observation that prayer is communication of the reality of who you are and who God is. It doesn't require always the abeyance of some type of traditional format, whether it be the davening, you know, and the rocking, you know, and the, you know, putting on tzitzis, you know, and talis, you know, and doing this, that, and the other thing, or, you know, making the cross symbols, you know, and doing the, you know, and having the two fingers or the one finger, or the three fingers or the, you know, whatever fingers, you know, you know, or the, now the heart, you know, doing the heart thing, you know. But God really, is about conversation and communication. That's what prayer is. It is that opportunity to get yourself in touch with himself so that communication can occur between the two. And as you do, then it becomes easier to leave things in his hands. I have told people at times, some people have come up to me and pray, said, you know, well, would you pray for me? And I'd say, you know, and kind of grimace, you know, because at one time in a church setting, you know, I think it was a Calvary, I'm not sure, it might have been some other church, but someone came up to me and said, would you pray about this? I said, and they told me, I said, no, I can't. I mean, it wasn't obviously against scripture, but the Lord told me no. And I said, no, I really can't. And they said, that's okay. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, that's kind of cool. And later, you know, about, I don't know, maybe a month later or something, you know, they came back and told me why. And, 
you know, I thank the Lord for telling me no. You know, I mean, it's one thing to be sympathetic of the needs of people, but it's another thing to be obedient to the direction that God gives you. So when I was put in that position of authority and responsibility, I needed to know that if I prayed, God would answer. And God did answer my prayers. Whenever I prayed, answers were made manifest to the person. And so sometimes God says no. And I know that right now it's popular to put all over the internet, you know, God always, you know, closes one door and opens another. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Excuse me, he can close the door and say, don't do nothing. Because you're disobedient in some other thing, you know. I mean, the reality is, no. Don't put in God's mouth words he hasn't said. Let God do what he does because he's in control. He's got the whole world in his hands. I mean, if you got to go back to the simplicity of it all. And the reality is, if we really trusted him, we would want him to answer, not give our patronizing, wishy-washy, Christianless, you know, kind of s snowball prayers in hell that, you know, don't go anywhere, you know, that make the person feel good and they walk away thinking God's going to answer, when in reality, in your own heart, you knew that it was false. No, Tozer says, be real, be honest, be sincere. People have told me sometimes, you know, I even remember one time I they said, you know, well, I'm just praying that God will bring me a, you know, a meal. I said, okay, well, let's go. They said, well, what? I said, well, God answered your prayer. Let's go. <laughs> you know, that was the answer. You know, I didn't have to pray. I went and fed them. You know, I mean, come on. How real is that? And the point being is that you just need to recognize it's not about you when you pray, and it's not about God when you pray. It's about communication, conversation, and then the last part, cooperation cooperating and agreeing with God of what he wants to do not your will but his will done you see that communication of course I'm sick so I'll never get this out this will be fun help me <laughs> um, communication yeah conversation and cooperation wow you know but those things having a conversation you know in communication with God which means two way you know and then cooperating with what his responses are his will what he says to do you do it's pretty simple when you just put it back into perspective and that's what Tozer wants us to do for ourselves so always <coughs> to have in prayer communication because if not it's just petitioning and it's just like people standing at a wall beating their heads against it at the Western Wall and people in the Jewish community think it's wonderful you know and people around the world look at all these Jews standing there davening and you know like throwing up Hail Marys. It's like a Hail Mary pass. Why would you stand at a wall knowing full well that you're going nowhere? I would rather pray with knowledge and with, with cooperation, communication, and conversation than to stand in the midst of Jerusalem itself where I have stood at the Wailing Wall looking at some 2,000 year old stone, you know, and everybody else's sweat and spittle and whatever else is there, you know, that unfortunately you know doesn't do you any good at all there is no special blessing upon standing at a wall and thinking that God will hear and right where you're at God will hear you as you are where you are if you just be honest about the way you are